Hello and welcome to the St. Stephen's Sunday School class time. Woo! This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we approach our, we're in the last month of the year, and you certainly everybody's rushing around talking about Christmas, getting Christmas gifts and all. So I thought perhaps the December series should ask the question, who is Jesus? And so last week we talked about Jesus was the Word of God. Today we are going to talk about Jesus, God's final Word. So before we start, let me do customary. Let me say hello to Hardin County, Indiana uh, campus, Hardin County campus, the Louisville campus, the E campus, Dosca Manor, and all of those who do not belong to either one of those campuses. But we still welcome you and we thank you for tuning in and being with us. We thank you so very much. Now, this is... Serious. Well, it's always serious, but I, I think last week we got a little deep uh, on you, and it's good because we need to stop and think. Someone asked me, said, uh, so what we're going to study in uh, December? And I said, the series is going to be, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? He said, oh, I know. I said, so who is he? Uh, he's my Lord and my Savior. What does that mean? You saying what he is to you, but who is he? Because, see, he's going to be Jesus whether he's your Lord and Savior or not. You believing in God does not make God exist. He's God whether you want him to be God or not. And he's Jesus, whether we want to accept it or not. There is nothing we can do except accept him as God's last word. So after studying this series, students will know emphatically and see that Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man in one, one person. And he will be so forever. He was both human and divine. He was human because God was his father. I mean, he divine because God was his father. He human because Mary was his mother. He's so human, he thirsts for water. But he's so divine that he walked on water. He was so human that he, 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 he prayed. But he's so divine that he's answering prayers. So he is human and divine. And students will understand why and how he is the word of God. In fact, you better get this. He is God's last word. In knowing and understanding that we will realize the real meaning of Christmas. And Christmas was not the beginning of Jesus' life. And see, most believers begin the story of Jesus far too late. When speaking of his beginning, many of us talk of Bethlehem and that starfield night when the Christ was born of the Virgin Mary in a smelly Middle Easter stall, and there was no room for them in the inn. And the shepherds, they were told by the angels in the sky, and they went to see him. And then we proceed to tell of his life, his death, his resurrection, and the promise of his return to take us home to heaven with him. But in the words of Paul to the Colossians, we find, and I think I said that last week, 
we find one of the most incredible statements in all the Bible. Christ is the visible image. Woo! Come on, listen to me. He's the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything. Everything. Yeah, I said everything. Not, and John said it this way, there was not anything made that was made that he didn't have his hand in on it. Now, but that statement takes us back to before Bethlehem, back even before creation, back into the eternal counsels of God before time began. I think I said to you last week, I think I said it, that God stepped out into space and there was nothing. Nothing held God up. God don't need anything to hold him up. Paul spoke about Jesus not only as the image of the invisible God, but he said by him all things were created. He is before all things. Now, let me say, uh, <clears throat> you remember, well, let me just back up and say this. Uh, Jesus did not appear on the scene in Bethlehem, and that's when he came to being. He has been here all along. So, when we read the initial verse of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, we find Jesus there. We should not think in terms of Genesis 1-1 as being the beginning of everything. We said that last week. We got to keep harping on this because we need to get that in our spirit. It wasn't. John tells us in the beginning was the word and the word is Jesus. Jesus, God's last word, God's final word. Let me ask you this. How many times did our mothers tell us? And, and, they, and they said it. Mama said it. And that's my final word. They meant, and we knew, don't ask me again, because my answer will not change. And if you asked again, you, you might have got a little tap in the mouth. Said, didn't I tell you? That was my final answer. In fact, you know, there was a TV show. I can't remember what TV show it was. But they would ask the contestant, is that your final answer? And when they said yes, that means there was no change coming. Well, guess what? God's final answer, his final word is Jesus. And that will not change. Reject Jesus and you have rejected God's word. And so you may as well look for a home in a place that is always hot and it has no air condition. Reject Jesus. There is nothing else. God is through. He has given his final word, Jesus. And we are to come in to him through Jesus. Now, all right, I just want that to stick with you. You need to, that's how come it's important for us to evangelize and tell people. So that they know you reject Jesus. He just, he not a man just like any other man. No, you are rejecting God's last word. God said, I ain't got nothing else to say to you. Is that what you want? Fine. Do it your way. 
see, when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, God spoke to them. He would fellowship with them in person. He walked with them. He talked with them. He gave them directions. <laughs> but that didn't last long. Their fellowship was broken by Adam and Eve's sin. And as you know, Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden. But God still spoke to them outside of the garden. But it would never be the same. It would not be enough. So, let's skip ahead in time. When the Hebrews were slaves. For over 400 years they were slaves in Egypt. God heard their cries for mercy. He spoke to Moses. And had Moses lead them out of bondage. He spoke to Moses. Giving him the law. But it would not be enough. Many years later. They were captives again. This time in Babylon. Again after many years. God heard their cries led them back to the promised land. In the midst of all of this, he sent his prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Daniel, Ezekiel, and others, men called of God, spoken to by God, relaying the message of God to God's people. The Israelites were never left without a word from God. All oh, you have to hear me now. But it would not be enough. God spoke. But he never said all that he needed to say. There was something lacking. And we continue to lack that something. Until God. Woo. Spoke his final word. In the past. God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in many ways, various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Today, God speaks to us through Jesus. There is nothing left to be said. Don't think you're going to get a divine revelation from God. Jesus is God's final word. And he has been quiet. He has been quiet. The way he speaks, well, that's maybe next week's lesson. Let's go on. Hebrew 1, 1 through 3. We said this several times now. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days, because you know we're living in last days, spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir over all things through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, by the word of his, that's power, by the word of his power, when he had by himself, nobody else but him, Purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, the writer of Hebrew declared that God spoke in the past at various times and in various ways. Beginning with Adam, God spoke to us in various times throughout recorded scripture. 
to Adam. God revealed Christ was would come through, was going to come and crush the serpent's head. That's the first prophecy that we receive, and that was in Genesis 3.15. He revealed that there will be coming one through the seed of the woman to crush the serpent's head. To Abraham, God revealed Christ would come through a nation he would birth, and he gave birth to that nation, which we call the Jews, the Israelites. To Jacob, God revealed Christ would come through the tribe of Judah. Now, last week I mentioned to you that there were some prophecies that went with that lesson that for your information, well, uh, let me see if I got them here. Yeah, you can, you can still go online and look it up. Those are the prophecies that Christ fulfilled. And it said that he would come through the tribe of Judah to Michael. God revealed that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. And the angels appeared to the shepherds, said, For unto you is born this day in the city of David, Bethlehem. And that's where Christ was born, to Zechariah. God revealed Christ would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. To Isaiah, God revealed Christ would be wounded for our transgressions. Now see, and as we said last week, <clears throat> all of this was in parts and pieces. No one had, it was fragmented. Let me put it that way. That's the word that we used last week. It was fragmented. But now we see, so how could Zechariah understand that he had written, uh, Jerusalem, here comes your, your king riding on the fall of a donkey. But yet he also says he will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Isaiah had prophesied that he would be born, his name would be Wonderful, Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He wrote that. And then by the time you get to Isaiah 53, he said he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. That, how could they understand that they couldn't? To David, God revealed that Christ would be crucified and pierced, but he will rise again. Woo! At Mount Harbor, see, so they had to take faith. He spoke to Moses through a burning bush in various times and in various ways. He spoke through a burning bush to Moses at Mount Sinai. God spoke to thunder and lightning to the prophet Elijah. God spoke through a still small voice to Ezekiel, he spoke in a vision. To Daniel, he spoke through dreams. To Balaam, he spoke through donkey. To Jacob, God spoke through an angel. To Joseph, he spoke to Joseph, Jesus' father, in a dream. Yeah, yeah God did. He spoke at various times in various ways. Spoke to us in times past. But in this dispensation, of grace in which we live, he has spoken to us by his son. Jesus is the final word, period, end of discussion. Now, let us look and see why Jesus is God's final word. Colossians 2.17 For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet 
to come. And Christ himself is that reality. So now let us look at Jesus from shadow to substance. See, he's a shadow in the Old Testament. We don't quite see him clearly. And the Old Testament is a book of shadows depicting progressive, which we talked about last week, images of our coming Redeemer. The Apostle Paul spoke of this as being a shadow of things to come. You see, the tabernacle that Moses built in the wilderness was a foreshadow, shadow though, of what heaven would be like. And so we find shadows of things to come. But now let me say this. There must be two elements in producing a shadow. To produce a shadow, there needs to be both light and an image. So behind the words of scripture, there is a great light. And that light is shining on the image of Christ. And Christ is casting his shadow across its pages. Now, I think I told you last week that I even consider after all this, study, I consider we might need to do a study of, of finding Christ in every book of the Bible. Because he's there. It's a shadow. But the clarity of any shadow depends on the angle with which the light strikes the body. See, see, early in the morning, when the sun is rising, if you stand in the sunlight, your shadow is completely out of proportion. Teach Geneva. Get this. However, as the sun continues to rise, the shorter and more revealing the shadow becomes. At mid-morning, when the sun is at a 45 degree angle, the shadow becomes the perfect shape of the body. Which reminds me one. I saw a little kid, this was on, I don't know, Facebook, I guess. I guess that's, that's where it had to be. And I go on that very seldom, but I go. And this kid saw his shadow. And he tried to, he thought it was something, so he tried to get away from it. Only to turn around and see it was still right there with him. And he ran some more. And he, he didn't know that it was a shadow because the light was shining. So, let me go back. When the sun reaches a certain level, it zinc in at high noon, the shadow disappears, and the body is seen as it actually is. And so that's what we have in the revelation of Jesus Christ in the Bible. When the sun of revelation begins to shine way back in the early chapters of Genesis, the shadow is dim and a bit faint. But as the chapters unfold and more light appears, Christ comes into sharper focus. And by the time we reach Isaiah chapter 53, there appears the perfect shadow of the one who will be smitten and, by God and afflicted, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity, and led as a lamb to the slaughter. But it's only when we turn the pages 
from Malachi 4, verse 6, because that's the last of Malachi. We step into the New Testament to Matthew 1, 1. But let me tell you, there is a long span of silence between Malachi 4 and 6 to Matthew 1 and 1 when it is high noon on God's clock. Matthew 1 and 1 is high noon on God's clock. That means the shadow disappears and ah, we see Jesus. No more shadow. No more types. No more prophecies. Just Jesus. The final word on all things. And of this final word, John said, <clears throat> uh, In the beginning was the word. The word was already existed. The word was God. The word was with God. And the word was God. Then in verse 14, the same chapter, so the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So, now, from shadow to substance, we look at Jesus was God's incarnated one. And perhaps the incarnation is the most generous display of divine love to be found anywhere at any time. You see, the incarnation of Christ is the Christian belief that God took human form by becoming Jesus. Incarnation literally means to take on flesh. For Christians, the incarnation shows that Jesus was fully God and fully human. And the, the word incarnate comes from Latin and means in the flesh. In equals in. Carnish equals flesh. In the flesh. So God sent his final word to us. And his final word is Jesus. What Jesus said to us in the Gospels. Listen to me now. What he said to us in the Gospels need no addendum or no addition. It is final. Now, let's go back to Gen Hebrews. Yeah, yeah, you all, by the time we finish with this, you're going to know Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 4 this time. We're not going to stop at 3. In the past, God spoke through the prophets in the past to our ancestors in many times and many ways. In these final days, though, he spoke to us through a son. God made his son the heir of everything and created the world through him. The son is the light of God's glory and the imprint of God's being. Dr. Cosby puts it this way. He said if it was somehow possible to get the fingerprints of Jesus and the fingerprints of God, we will find that they are identical and no 
two people have the same fingerprints, but God and Jesus does because they one and the same. You remember he said to Philip, Philip says, show us the Father. He said, Philip, 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 have I been with you so long that you still don't know that the Father and I am one? He who has seen me has seen the Father. After he carried out the cleansing of people from their sins, he sat down at the right side of the highest majesty. And the sun became so much greater than the other messengers. This is verse 4. You need to outline, highlight it. And the sun became so much greater than any other messengers, such as angels, that he received a more important title than theirs. Now, first of all, we see God, a Jesus, God's superior one. Because we see in verse 1, God communicated several ways. First of all, he created, he uh he communicated through creation. Now let me say this. Creation is natural revelation. It's there for everybody to see. It's just not for the believer to see that the sun is shining or the rain is falling. Uh, it's winter time. And so the, the trees will begin to shed their leaves because you got to rake up all them leaves. Uh, you will see that when the summer comes, things begin to blossom out. That's natural re uh, revelation for everybody to see. So look at Romans 1, 18 through 20. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who surpass the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Now, I may not know who, um, who made this table here. I may not know who made the chair, but I know somebody did. It's no sense of me denying, oh, the chair don't exist, and I'm sitting in it. So God proved he's superior one in communication. And then God, oh, okay, let's look at, at Psalms 19 and 1. I, I, that's new con, uh, a century version and the message, and I just love it. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the skies announce what his hands have made. Now, because if you remember, uh, Paul in the, in the last part of what we just read, uh, Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 20. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse. And so now Psalm 19 and 1 tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. And the skies announce what his hands have made. The message put it this way. God's glory is on tour in the skies, God craft on exhibit across the horizon. 
Madam Day hold classes every morning and Professor Knight lectures each evening. Woo! I like the way they say that. So I don't care. The heavens declare who he is. So we have no excuse. Then our conscience, our conscience tells us. Paul, in writing to the Romans 14, 15, said, When outsiders who have never heard of God's law follow it more or less by instinct, they confirm its truth by their obedience. They show that God's law is not something alien imposed on us from without but woven into the very fabric of our creation. There is something deep within them that echoes God's yes and no, right and wrong. Their response to God's yes and no will become public knowledge on the day God makes his final decision about every man and woman. The message from God that I proclaim through Jesus Christ takes into account all these differences. So he has spoken to us through creation, through conscience, and through clergy. In the past, God spoke through the prophets to our ancestors in many times and many ways. Today, he speaks to us through our pastors, our teachers, our preachers, our evangelists. God is still speaking. But in these last days, he speaks through special revelation. And that special revelation is Jesus Christ, his, his last word. And in these final days, he spoke to us through a son. God made his son the heir of everything and created the world through him. And we go back to verse 4 again, and the son became so much greater than the other messengers, such as angels, that he received a more important title than them. (coughs) But now, God, Christ is superior, not only in communication, But in creation, all things were made by him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Colossians 1, 16, for by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things created through him and for him. And then... Uh, God is superior, uh, Jesus, God's superior one. He's superior in continuation. Everything, the sun still rises in the east and sets in the west. The winter time is on schedule. The calendar tells you it's winter out. Well, it says it's fall. Uh, Sometimes we think, okay, well, now, you know, it's warm today. But guess what? In continuation, He holds everything together. Now, point three, Jesus, number one, he was God's superior one. Now we see Jesus, the believer's selected one. We select to follow him. Why? Because of his person. He's the image of the invisible God. He is God's icon. That means the same express image. We select him because of his power. Because through him he created everything. And we select him because of his preeminence. Everything will disappear. But you will remain. They will all wear out like clothes. You will fold them up like a coat. And they will be changed like clothes. 
but you are always the same. You remember the verse, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Well, that's our lesson. I didn't think I was going to get through on time, but yes, I did. Next week, we will talk about Jesus, the one and only. Jesus, the one and only. As we continue, who is Jesus? I want you to think about that. And here's what I want you to do. After you think about it, uh, go into the chat room next week and tell us who Jesus is so that I can tell you what some of you say who Jesus is. All right? See you next week. Bye-bye.